Watch this. For nearly 30 years, the spirit of Boise Balloon Classic has filled the late summer skies in the city of trees. With cancer claiming the life of its founder, will the festival continue? It's a marathon, not a sprint, unless you're watching what's happening in Oregon's legislature. What usually takes five months, they're squeezing into five weeks. A lot of people see them as rusted out eyesores. So what's the deal with these Detroit relics relegated to the riverbank in Eagle? There's a lot of lawmakers in Idaho State House who, if not already, in the next couple of weeks will be itching to end the legislative session and head home, having businesses and ranches to run. It's the same antsy approach every year as we get further into February and with the session usually running at least until the middle of March. Could be different. Could be that we put a limit on how long our lawmakers have to make laws and solve funding crises which is how they're doing it in Oregon. Starting today, Oregon legislators have just 35 days to get it done. Why is that? Well, up until 10 years ago, the Oregon Constitution only allowed the legislature to meet every other year, odd years to be specific, for a maximum of 160 days. Then in 2010, they amended it to allow a 35 day session every even numbered year, which is what we're in right now. So Oregon lawmakers are walking into a sprint session in Salem, hoping to chase down, consider and carry more than 250 pieces of legislation across the finish line in just five weeks. Some of those issues they hope to get to in the abbreviated assemblage, homelessness, gun control and climate change, all things that don't actually seem agreeable to quick fixes. That climate change thing, you may remember, caused quite the episode last session when 11 Republicans walked out of the Senate and out of the state for nine days to avoid a vote on a controversial cap and trade emissions bill. Governor Kate Brown authorized state police to quote round up the senators and bring them back to Salem. They eventually returned after the bill had been killed. A similar bill will be reintroduced this year that would cap greenhouse gas emissions for transportation, manufacturing and utilities. Those in favor call it the country's most progressive climate policy, saying it not only cuts emissions, but would put money into moving the state economy and infrastructure toward handling more intense weather events that come along with climate change. One difference with this year's version of the bill, most of Eastern Oregon, about 60% of it, would not have regulations put on gas for vehicles, meaning the logging and ag industries closer to Idaho may catch a break. The goal to reduce greenhouse gases to where they were before 1990. What they couldn't get done in five months last year, though, they're going to try to get signed in just five weeks. Walkouts not included. Perhaps a more questionable calendar coupling since the May December romance is the March August school bond vote, at least according to Republican Representative Wendy Horman. She wants to eliminate March and August as options for bond and levy elections because so few voters turn out in those months. Basically, Horman wants to limit such elections to twice a year, just May and November, to avoid a small number of people making important decisions for so many. School districts often ask voters to approve bonds and build schools to build schools and levies for ongoing expenses. And under current law, they can up to four times a year. Critics say the problem with Representative Horman's bill, she didn't talk to any school districts prior to introducing it. House Democrat Brooke Green said the legislation could have some major ramifications, that is, for school districts. That bill now heads to the House State Affairs Committee for debate. And there's another bond bill out there as well. You may remember Representative Heather Scott. She has a similar bill sitting in a committee that would force school districts to wait 11 months before putting a failed bond back on that ballot. After a lot of complaints by voters, Republicans say they're now changing course on a bill that some say would disenfranchise hundreds of voters before the upcoming presidential primaries. Currently, voters can switch parties right up until the primary, even the day of. Well, that bill would have required voters to register with a particular party 90 days before the primary. So it would have also been retroactive after December 10th, meaning voters wouldn't be able to switch primary or parties for the 2020 primary. That means the House State Affairs Committee changed the bill so it will not take effect until July. One of the things that we're seeing on the rise is crashes caused by various forms of distracted driving. And the police are able to issue infractions and other tickets after that has occurred, but there's really no tool that they have 
to um, help people break the habit of using and being distracted by their cell phone while they're driving. So this gives them that tool. Holly Woodings and the Boise City Council are going ahead with its plan to draft a hands free ordinance, despite the fact state lawmakers could make it all for naught. Distracted driving is a problem across the country, including in the city of trees. Boise police say that most traffic accidents in the city are due to some form of distracted driving. As it's written now, drivers who break the rules would be subject to a $90 ticket and court costs. However, no points would go on the offenders driving records. There's also a bill currently making its way through the state house that would make distracted driving an infraction statewide. And if that were to pass, it would supersede city law. So every city is on the same page. And that would include Meridian, Blaine County, Pocatello, to name a few places that have already passed hands free laws. So it could mean all the time the city of Boise is about to put into a law like this. Like we said, it would be all for naught. Then again, the legislature could reject the bill and then leave the city without its own ordinance. So it's kind of like a catch 22, which is why the groundwork continues. And if you are wondering, inattentive driving, currently a misdemeanor in the state of Idaho, meaning if you are convicted, you could face jail time and a hefty fine. If you are interested in attending that meeting, it is coming up tomorrow at Boise City Hall and it starts at 6 p.m. Well, this is the part of the show where we answer your most burning questions. What's up with that? And today we have one from Ted. Ted asks this. What's going on with that vacant property on Whitewater Park Boulevard and Main Street in Boise? Maybe you've seen it. Well, Ted, it turns out not a lot. Absolutely nothing. <laughs> so our trustees are still evaluating all the options that are possible, which are numerous. The College of Western Idaho bought the 10 to 11 acre site back in 2015 for roughly $8.8 .8 million in hopes of expanding their campus in Ada County. They wanted to build a five or six story building there, but here we are nearly five years later. That prime piece of property on the western end of downtown Boise, sitting by the river, still sits empty. We don't have any immediate plans for the property. It is something that is on our rolls and we're looking at it for a number of different potential things, but, but nothing's been decided yet. CWI did try to pass a bond in 2016 for $180 million to pay for construction at the new site, and that failed, but just barely. There's no talk of another bond, though, and as we learned, CWI recently renewed their lease at their current Ada County Cap campus, which is on Overland and Maple Grove. They've resigned there for another five years. So again, what does that mean for this property at Whitewater Park Boulevard and Main Street? Well, if they can't come up with the money to build, would CWI consider selling it? You know, that's one of the topics of conversation that they kind of nibbled at, but I would believe that in the future that as planning and ideas come around, that's got to be part of the discussion. You may recognize that piece of land because there was talk that the land would be sold for the proposed multi-purpose stadium in downtown Boise, but CWI says there are no plans for that, not to their knowledge and not with their involvement. It's been an end of summer staple in the city of trees for nearly three decades. What about this summer? The founder of the Spirit of Boise Balloon Classic has passed away. Will his legacy go with him? Old hollowed out cars along the hallowed ground of the Boise River. How they got there and why. And have you seen anything that makes you go, huh, I wonder why? We want to know about it. Text us at the number on your screen, 208-321-5614. You can also send us an email, the 208 at ktvb.com. For us, Iowa speaks. The first test of the Democratic presidential candidates is here. The prize. Of the
bringing the community together. That's what the people closest to Scott Spencer say he was all about. We told you Friday about Scott's passing after a battle with late stage colon cancer. Over the weekend, a lot of you posted on social media about Scott and the now iconic event he brought to Boise, the spirit of Boise Balloon Classic. And some are wondering now, will the event continue without Scott? Joe Paris reports. He, he was just really a master of his craft um, at what he did. And, and at the same time, he was uh, just remarkable as an individual. Friends and family of Scott Spencer continue to look back at his life and remember. It's tough, though, to look back at Scott's life without mentioning the Spirit of Boise Balloon Classic. The fall favorite created and ran by Scott and Lori Spencer has been a tradition since 1991. But after Scott's passing on Friday, some started to wonder if the event will continue without its creator. Scott's longtime best friend, Steve Schmader, has some insight. So, Steve, will the Spirit of Boise continue? You bet. Uh, th that was Scott's desire to see it continue on even after his passing and and I think that he has assembled a, a really high quality team of people uh, over the you know last 30 years of, of doing the rally. 2020 will mark the 30th anniversary of the balloon festival and Steve says with that milestone a new name may be in order one that will honor Scott. In all fairness, I think the, the rally will end up being named after Scott the Scott Spencer Spirit of Boise Balloon Classic. While the specifics of the event are still being ironed out, Steve says that the people around Scott are ready to carry on the tradition that Scott loves so much. They will look forward to standing in his legacy and, and, and making, it, making sure that it goes on for the people of Boise and the community. And to read more about Scott's life and career here in the city of Boise and around the world, you can go to our website right now. KTVB.com and Brian, we saw a lot of really nice tributes on social media over the weekend. I know for that 2020 edition of the Spirit of Boise, it'll mean a little extra this year. And it's hard not to. I mean, Scott was really like to overuse the phrase salt of the earth. He was a really great guy and for nearly three decades. I mean, he made this thing his own to really showcase the city of trees. It's amazing. All right. Thank you, Joe. <laughs> Winter weather in the forecast for us. Seems like we've waited a long time. A warm December, a warm January, and now February. Doing a February thing for us today. Temperatures right now in the mid to upper 30s, 40 degrees in Ontario and in the teens in Stanley. Although the wind today didn't allow us to feel like it was in the 30s because it's been blasting in out of the northwest. You can see the peak max gust that we've seen through the day today, making it close to 45 mile per hour winds in Mountain Home and 40 mile per hour winds for Ontario down through the Magic Valley as well. These winds will calm through the rest of this evening and overnight tonight, but in the meantime, it's still with us, making it feel like it's in the 20s through much of the Treasure Valley. It feels like the single digits up through the Stanley area. Lots of sunshine that we enjoyed today. Tomorrow, even better news, keeping the sunshine, but without the wind. So even though our temperatures tomorrow afternoon will be very similar to what we had today, it will feel warmer tomorrow since we won't have the northwesterly wind to contend with. With. We do have some moisture that's heading in our direction that comes into play on Wednesday. We'll talk more about that with future cast tonight. Clear skies allowing for the temperatures to fall back off into the teens and tomorrow 34 to 39 for our afternoon highs and tomorrow is actually our first 6 p.m. sunset for the season. So continuing to gain daylight as we wrap up winter and head into spring. Magic Valley forecast tomorrow starting in the low to mid teens, wrapping up the day mid to upper 20s, mostly sunny skies. Guys, similar story across the central mountains with a very cold start, just two to start in Sun Valley, wrapping up the day in the 20s. In the west central mountains, 40 degrees for a high in Riggins, Long Valley, looking at the uh, low to mid 20s. Lower Treasure Valley, mid to upper 30s, and a similar story for the upper Treasure Valley as well. Again, keeping the sunshine, but ditching the wind. Then into Wednesday, cold air is in place for us. We get our next slug of moisture that arrives. You put the cold air and the precipitation together, and you get snow to start on Wednesday morning could even mean some minor accumulations for the Treasure Valley before eventually we push in some warmer air and change it over to rain. How much snow is on the way? Early estimates, but I'd say around an inch, give or take, maybe up to close to two inches as you get closer.
closer to the foothills, maybe even less than that, a half an inch to a coating in some locations as you're seeing there in Mountain Home. We'll stay on top of that part of the forecast for you again because it may affect the Wednesday morning commute. Then we slide this ridge over the Pacific Northwest and that will warm our temperatures up overnight Wednesday into Thursday and look at where those temperatures go back up to near 50 degrees around 10 degrees above seasonal averages and that continues into the rest of the week and into the weekend although conditions should stay a little unsettled still a chance for some showers Friday and also again on Saturday with some more seasonable conditions expected as we cruise into next week as always you can find a closer look at the forecast at ktvb.com a walk along the green belt is supposed to be a view of nature so what's with these unsightly rust buckets banking the river hide your kids hide your wife hold on that, that's not right especially since this guy says he's not hiding his wife Every once in a while, we'll see a post pop up on social media, a picture like that one right there that shows old rusted cars lining the Boise River banks near Eagle. Maybe you've seen these Detroit derelicts on a walk along the Greenbelt, and more often than not, a scroll through the comments section would find more than one person wringing their hands about the sanitary state of the river and how it used to be a dumping ground and so on and so forth. And while some of the stories about the river being a receptacle for trash way back when are true, the car thing doesn't quite fit that description. We got the true history from the curator of Eagles Museum of History and Preservation. I've heard everywhere from this is so neat to what is this to this looks terrible. My name is Elena Dunn and I'm the curator at the Eagle Museum of History and Preservation here in Eagle, Idaho. These cars were placed here in the 1950s. They were an experiment used in erosion control for the river. They noticed that the banks of the river were being eaten away and they thought the best thing that they could do is put something very large, heavy, and cars were readily available in the junkyard. So they went ahead, cut out the guts, the gas containers, the engines, took the tires off, and went ahead and put them hood first into, uh, into the river. And they worked really well. It's just they weren't really environmentally friendly. 
There's never been any talk about removing them just because they are such a part of the bank now. Trees have grown through them. The bank has grown around them. To remove the automobiles would kind of destroy the bank and destroy the purpose of the erosion control. So at this point in time, it really is easier and, and better to, to keep them as part of the bank. Elena tells us there are about two dozen classic cars lining the banks down there near Eagle. And when they were first put in, they were placed hood first into the water or toward the water. But thanks to the current, most of them have kind of shifted a bit. By the way, Eagle's Museum of History and Preservation gives guided tours of the area. That happens beginning in May, so you can actually walk down and get a closer look at them all for yourself. This is kind of the only time of year until that water really rises up about June, about May and June, when those cars start to go a little bit further under the water. But you can find a schedule for those tours in the upcoming City of Eagle Activity Guide. If you're lucky, you can score an eagle on a golf course. If you're even luckier, it's not the eagle you thought it was. Do you ever feel the need to explain yourself before anyone even asks you about it? If you've ever started a sentence with the phrase, it's not what it looks like, well, then you have to feel for this person. Seen driving, driving down the interstate this weekend, you have to agree, it's a pretty good candidate for a segment we like to call, What's Your Sign? Judy Jackson shared this photo with us, but she wasn't the only one who thought it was odd. We got a couple of pictures sent in. Judy says she was driving east on I-84 near the coal exit yesterday afternoon when she spotted this SUV with what appears to be a bundle of something wrapped up and tied on the roof but it's what is tied to the rack on the back that looked a little peculiar. And if you've seen the original National Lampoon's Vacation movie, you may agree it looks like a prone portrayal of Aunt Edna, which is why the driver decided to derail all the DIY detectives before they dialed local law enforcement by attaching a hand scribbled sign that read, not my wife, <laughs> just to alleviate any sort of concern. The forerunner with the Candy County plates with either a well-wrapped weather protected parcel or maybe it was a not so subtle, subtle foolproof way to commit a crime. I don't know. Just kind of have to hide it out in the open and tell everybody it's not what you think it is. All right. Meanwhile, 
What is so Idaho and so American? This, this right here. Mackenzie Peters and Tyler Aubertine sent us this video. Mackenzie says they were at Ridgecrest Golf Course in Nampa Saturday morning. She says her dad went to hit the ball in the second hole when a ball, bald eagle that is, landed near the ball and tried to pick it up with its talons. Mackenzie said they all assumed the eagle thought the ball was an egg. And then again, we all assumed her dad made an eagle on the par four. I know, I went there. They call that par four on the edge, by the way, which is how I assume her dad played the rest of the hole on edge. My goodness, that's a big bird. Well, if you see anything that makes you think, wow, that's so Idaho or that's so not Idaho, send it to us via email at the 208.com or the 28 at KTVB.com. Excuse me. You can text us as well. 208-321-5614 or join our face Facebook group. Remember to use Hashtag the 208 or hashtag so Idaho. And here's a look at what we're working on for the news at six. An Idaho lawmaker hoping to close a loophole allowing sex offenders to live near daycares. Gretchen Parsons spoke, spoke with the bill's sponsor this afternoon. We're going to hear what they have to say. The Broncos on a roll and looking to make it five wins in a row as they travel to Laramie to face the Cowboys of Wyoming. Will Hall has a game preview plus those stories. And so much more coming up on the news at 6.